Hello and welcome to another Sojing session. Today um, is Friday, if I'm not mistaken. And it means today, according to the schedule, we are doing a random one-off topic. That means I pick a random topic and I stream it for uh, for the whole stream or for the whole session, as a matter of fact, because I'm not streaming right now. I'm not live. It's completely offline recording. So, and the topic of today's session is WASI, right? WebAssembly System Interface. Uh, I worked a lot of with just pure WebAssembly. As a matter of fact, I wrote a lot of small different projects in WebAssembly. I think the recent one was a uh, Rust browser game. I really recommend to check it out. It actually turned out very, very interesting. So uh, I'm going to put it in the description. Rust uh, browser game, right. And also maybe I'm going to actually put the link to the WASI. I think this is official <laughs> website of WASI. I don't know how to check if it's an official website of WASI, but may maybe it is. Anyway, so, but I never worked like specifically with WebAssembly system interface. I never felt the need to, um, to use it. And the interesting thing about this stuff is that, um, I guess it sort of, I already mentioned that it sort of competes with POSIX, right? So it basically defines its own system layer, but on top of WebAssembly. And I don't quite understand why we need WASI if we just have POSIX. Maybe you can argue that POSIX is sort of like an old and obsolete thing that was designed for a completely different environment or something like that. But mscripting actually implements like a POSIX layer on, on top of on top of the browser. And uh, that's how it ports all of these things. And that's precisely why I want to learn this thing. Like I know nothing about it, but from what I heard about it, it's just basically POSIX for WebAssembly, right? So it's essentially POSIX for WebAssembly. Even though you can literally implement POSIX on top of WebAssembly, still we need a separate thing. Um, and uh, to understand what is the WebAssembly system interface, we need to understand precisely on a technical level uh, what is WebAssembly itself. So do you guys know what is WebAssembly? I, I don't know what is a WebAssembly. Do I look like a programmer? Let's actually Google it up. Uh, so WebAssembly, mm, 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 mm. WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. That's a pretty precise description. I think it's a pretty precise description. But um, okay, so let's take a look at these two things. What is a stack-based virtual machine? When you explain a stack-based virtual machine to um, to programmers who are familiar with such thing as fourth, they will instantly tell you, oh, this is like fourth, right? Because they are familiar with fourth, so uh, they will see a lot of similarities. But the thing is, like, there is a lot of stack-based system all around us, and people don't really notice them because people usually work on a level higher than them, right? So, um, so essentially, JVM, for instance, is also a stack-based virtual machine. It's also like fourth, right? And as a matter of fact, on a very low level in the native code, you also have a, at least call stack sometimes. And you can put the data on that stack. Uh, and it's just like, yeah, so there is a lot of like things just like fourth. Um, but anyway, so stack-based virtual machine is basically a machine that has a stack and it has instructions that operate on that stack and perform different things on that stack. So essentially, like a simple virtual machine in C, right? So a simple virtual machine in C, uh, VM, let's, let's put it like this, essentially defines a, a bunch of uh, instructions, right? Let's define a couple of instructions. Um, so it's going to be instruction type. And what kind of instructions do we want for our stack-based virtual machine? So for now, let's define instruction uh, push that pushes a value on 
the stack of the virtual machine. Then uh, let's define something like add that takes two elements on the top of the stack and sums them up and puts the sum on the top uh, of the stack and print that takes the element at the top of the stack and prints it and of course removes it from the stack, right? It basically consumes it as well. So this is the instruction types that we can have in like a very small stack based virtual machine. So then we can define an instruction, right? So instruction is going to be structure. Uh, which consists of the instruction type and an optional operand. All right, so for now, the only instruction that will need an operand is probably push because it needs to push some data onto the stack. Add uh, takes the data from the stack and print also takes the data from the stack. They don't need the operands, but we're going to just provide the operand, you know, specifically for push at least. All right, and uh, that's it, believe it or not. Now you can just write a program and program is going to be an array of instructions right so let's actually write a very simple program so the first instruction is going to be uh something like um got emacs instruction push and we're going to push an operand uh 35 right and let's push another operand like uh, 34 right after that uh we can sum them up right we can sum them up and we can print the result there we go we just wrote a very simple program on our imaginary virtual machine yes so that's that's how we do that right so let's actually try to uh, try to compile this entire thing and see if it's going to compile or not so let's include in a couple of things in here uh so it's going to be stdio stdlib and uh, maybe it would makes sense to actually i don't know let's actually just compile like this w l w extra o main main c and let's just compile this entire stuff and it compiled first try not bad not bad at all all right so we also need to know the size of the program so let's actually define program size and basically we take the size of the whole array right in bytes and divided by the size of a single element in bytes and this is how we get the amount of instructions in here right so now let's try to interpret this program so to interpret this program you're going to iterate through all of the instructions uh, starting from zero up until the program size right up until the program size and uh, dispatch upon the type of the instruction. So we see we iterate through all of the instructions and we look at their type and depending on the type of the instruction, we're gonna do different things. So uh, we're gonna do program IP type and how many instructions do we have in here? We have these three kinds of instructions. Three kinds of instructions, mate. Uh, case and I'm gonna query replace this thing with that there we go all right um so if you encountered push what you have to do you have to take the instructions operand and push the value of that operand onto the stack but we don't have a stack let's define a stack so uh it's going to be an array uh, of a particular capacity let's actually define stack capacity uh, and what's going to be the stack capacity? Let's say it's going to be 1024, right? And we also need a variable that keeps track of how many elements do we have on the stack, right? There we go. Uh, so we also need a couple of auxiliary functions that push elements on the stack and pop it from the stack and also check for stack underflow and stack overflow. So we're going to implement them in a second. So uh, let's quickly do that. So we're going to do something like stack push. Um, it accepts the value and you can't push a value onto the stack if the stack is already full so stack size has to be less uh, than stack capacity uh, and if you have enough data uh, enough space on the stack you just push the value into it there we go so we also need something like stack pop to get the elements off of the stack. Uh, so this one is not going to accept anything. And in here we need to make sure that stack at least has like one element. So it's greater than zero. And we can in that case return stack size minus minus. There we go. We have a stack push and stack pop. Pretty straightforward. All right. So if you encounter a push instruction, what you do? You just push uh, the operand of your instruction operand of your instruction on, on the stack, right? 
If you encounter add, you take first two element on top of the stack. So here comes the first element, it's going to be stack pop. Uh, here comes the second element. And then you push the sum of these two elements back onto the stack. There we go. So we implemented the second instruction. And the third instruction basically takes an element on, this, on top of the stack and prints it. So let's actually implement it like this. It's going to be print f d uh, stack pop and then break. And of course, if we encountered some value that doesn't represent any instruction type, we have to uh, assert that, right? We have to assert that saying something like um, invalid instruction. Right, this is an invalid instruction, and I think we'll need to include assert.h. And let's try to compile this entire thing, and it doesn't compile because stack uh, label can be only... Are you serious? Is that because I need to put curly braces in here? Is that what you want in here? Yes. Uh, but as you can see, it printed 69. Right, and if you take a look at the program that we actually wrote here, right, so we pushed 35 and 34, and then we added them together, and then we printed. So you can modify this program. For example, you can put one and uh, actually add it to two times. So now your value, your final value is going to be 70. There we go. We implemented a very simple stack-based virtual machine. Yes, in a nutshell, a stack-based virtual machine is this. A real-world stack-based virtual machine is going to have more instructions, it's going to have more concepts like uh, maybe on top of the stack, it's also going to have like a static memory that it can access and so on and so forth, right? It can have like a lot of different things, right? And uh, all right, so this is the um, stack-based virtual machine. What you can do with this thing, you can actually take this array and dump it as a binary data onto the file system, right? So let's actually uh, implement a function that will do that. Uh, save program. Mm, save program, let's say to file, All right? And this is going to be something like const char file path. Const char file path, and let's actually open the file. So it's going to be f open file path. We're going to open it for writing in binary. And after we're done, we're going to close this file. There we go. So, and we're going to use a function f write. Mm -mm -mm -mm. F right here it is here it is okay let's put it in here so what we're what we're uh, saving to the file we're saving the program the size of a single element of this program is uh, program zero right so the size of a single element and the amount of elements that we're saving is a program uh, program size right and after that we're saving it into the F there we go so we essentially dumped the program as binary data into the file system. Let's see how it's going to work. Uh, so, well, we probably need to do something like uh, save program to file and it's going to be a, a dump bin, right? Maybe let's actually pro uh, call it program uh, dot VM. Yeah, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to look, look cooler. All right, and we have a program.vm, 32 bytes of program.vm. And let's take a look at the, the hexadecimal representation. All right, so in the hexadecimal representation, you would see uh, four zeros. And these four zeros actually represent uh, instruction push. Right, so instruction push, because enumerations in C, they actually start with zero, then one, then two, and so on and so forth. And the single instruction is actually integer for this enumeration, four bytes for the type, and four bytes for the operand. Right, so the first four bytes is the instruction, and then four bytes of the operand. And uh, operand 23 in hexadecimal, um, so 23 is 35, precisely the number that we put in here. The next four is zeros again, so that means it's, it's another push. 22 is uh, one less, so that means it's 34. And here comes another instruction, right, instruction 1. Right, and that instruction is add. Since it doesn't have any operand, its operand is set to zero. And then we have an instruction print that is two. So as you can see, we sort of saved 
uh, the program into like a binary format and we can easily write a program that loads it up and interprets it so basically we can e easily unhard code this program and uh, uh, basically allow the user to load any kind of program from this file so we just implemented a binary format for our virtual machine right so it, this format is pretty crappy because it uh, depends on NDNS of the current machine so with the uh, with the machine with different NDNS you will have to like convert the bytes and stuff like that but ignoring that uh, we have a very simple virtual machine and a very simple uh, binary format for that virtual machine and again what is the WebAssembly? WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a stack based machine so conceptually WebAssembly is this it just has like slightly different format. It has a, like well thought out architecture and stuff like that compared to this thing. Yeah. It has more instructions. It has like um, a special memory, right? It has a special, uh, special memory region. It also has a mechanisms to interact with outside world. Uh, we also have a mechanism to interact with the outside world like print, but uh, WebAssembly has more complicated things. But in a nutshell, that's what it is yeah so it's a stack based uh virtual machine uh in a binary format so that's essentially what it is that is essentially what it is isn't that cool i think it's pretty cool <clears throat> so should i actually put this thing in the description if if anyone want to play with it um i don't know maybe some people want to play with it um, so I'm going to put a comment in here. Uh, maybe I want to actually put like a license. So here is the MIT license. You can do whatever you want with this thing under MIT license. And, uh, then we're going to, I'm going to have an instruction on how to build this entire thing. So it's going to be just, um, I don't know, just CCO main main dot C. Right, so you, maybe I'm not going to even put any instruction because you, yeah, just, just build it with any C standard compliant compiler right um okay and let me actually put it into the gist and i'm gonna put this thing in the description so we have bmc uh and there we go there we go i'm gonna create you know what i'm gonna create a secret gist just in case uh somebody will see me creating a public one and spoil the today's topic okay here is the secret gist and i'm gonna put this secret gist in the description um simple stack uh, based virtual uh machine in c there we go so it's it's very simple it's very straightforward uh and you can extend this virtual machine you can add more operations in here for instance you can add a subtract operation right or multiply operation or you can make it work with like floating point numbers and stuff like that as a matter of fact uh i some time ago i did exactly that i have a project of mine which is called bm which is essentially a very like a more complicated version of this virtual machine believe it or not so here you have three instructions but in this virtual machine uh let me see let me see i, I think we have 64 instructions right and uh, I think it's located somewhere in here right I think it's located somewhere in here uh, yeah see, here is the table of all of the instructions right so and as far as I can tell there is like 64 of them for different things and stuff like that it also has a mechanisms for uh, interacting with C code and whatnot and yeah it has a lot of things so all of that are instruction descriptions uh all of that are instruction descriptions <laughs> and it also has an interpreter and it also has a compiler from like two custom languages to this uh virtual machine and stuff like that so check it out it's actually pretty pretty interesting i do uh, development sessions for for this project on this channel as well uh my own virtual machine right so here it is so check it out it's pretty cool um but WebAssembly is actually more widespread right so this is a stack based virtual machine that is available in your browser you can already use it today 
um, and people usually use it by taking a C code or Rust code and compiling it down to WebAssembly. But you don't have to use languages to compile down to WebAssembly. You can actually write in WebAssembly directly. The same way we wrote the program directly in our virtual machine. Right. As you can see, we created a very simple virtual machine and we uh, wrote the program directly in the instructions of this virtual machine. In fact, you can do the same in WebAssembly, believe it or not. You can do the same in WebAssembly. Right. So uh, there is a thing called uh, what? 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 Yes, that's the thing. Uh, it stands for uh, Web S Embly Text. That's what it stands for. So since WebAssembly is a binary format, right? Just like the binary file that was uh, was outputted by our program. Uh, what is essentially this, but in a human readable uh, version, right? It's in a human readable version. So basically, it's assembly. <laughs> it's kind of confusing if you think about it. <laughs> so. Um, some time ago, right, people programmed in assembly. Everybody knows this low-level language called assembly. Before assembly, people programmed in uh, native instructions of the hardware. People were programming uh, very specific hardware. They would take the manual for that hardware, they would read it, understand it, and then a code in numbers of particular instructions and stuff like that. Um, so they would code directly in a native code. And then somebody uh, came up with an idea. OK, let's actually assign human readable mnemonics on these uh, like numbers and stuff like that and write programs in a text of these mnemonics and have a separate program that takes these human readable mnemonics and translates them into the machine readable code. And that thing was called assembly. Assembly was called a human readable uh, representation of a binary format <laughs> right so um, <laughs> so uh, yeah mm, how to say that yeah so assembly was uh, a human readable a readable format Web assembly, according to the definition from this, this website, is a binary instruction format. It's a binary format. And human readable, <laughs> human readable of the, a version of web assembly is not called assembly. It is called uh, web uh, assembly text. Uh, so this is a human readable format. <laughs> So assembly used to mean a human, human readable uh, format, but WebAssembly is not human readable. It's a binary format. You're not supposed to read it. The human readable version of WebAssembly is WebAssembly text. <laughs> yeah. So uh, WebAssembly text. There we go. <laughs> ah. All right. Um, understanding WebAssembly. So it uses something called S expressions, right? So it uses something called S expressions. Uh, yeah. Is there any information uh, on Wikipedia? I think there should be something on Wikipedia. Let's take a look at S expressions. What is S expression? S as we can. So S expressions is basically consists of two elements. They consist of atoms, right? They consist of atoms and they consist of lists, right? So a single element of this list would be called an atom and a sequence of atoms is a list. And you can also have nested lists, right? You can also have nested lists. Uh, so here is an example of an S expression, right? So this S expression has uh, an outer list that consists of two elements, first element and a second element. And each element of this list is a list by itself that consists of two elements, which are atoms. And this atom is called milk, uh, and this one is called juice, and this one is called honey, and this, called, uh, this one is called uh, marmalade. You can think of S expressions as uh, some sort of a tech, like a data format, like... Um, 
like JSON, right? So something like JSON. In JSON, you can also do something like maybe, I don't know, you can have an array uh, of array of these elements, which are going to be strings and so on and so forth, right? Um, yeah. Or you can think about XML, right? S expression is basically like similar to this kind of format. Right. And uh, uh, yeah, you, you basically write your WebAssembly code in S expressions like that. Uh, so let's actually try to write something. So writing a single function in WebAssembly would look like this. As far as I know, to start writing a program in WebAssembly, you first have to define a module, right? So I think this is the simplest uh, module that you can ever define. So um, let's actually put something like um, hello dot what. Right, so there we go. So here's a single module. And as far as I know, uh, there, are there are special tools uh, to take your WebAssembly text and turn into the binary WebAssembly, the one that can be run in your browser, right? So um, how is it called? I think it's called Wabbit. Yeah, I think this thing, yeah, yeah, yeah this thing is called Wabbit. The WebAssembly Binary Toolkit. The WebAssembly Binary Toolkit. One of the tools in that toolkit is what to wasm so it takes WebAssembly text and converts it to a binary representation of WebAssembly. So you can find the source code of this thing in here. I'm going to put it in the description just for you. Emacs, <laughs> I, can't. I just want to go to the description uh, and love it. So what it stands for WebAssembly. Yeah, I already said binary toolkit. Yeah. yeah. So here's the Wabbit. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, let's actually take this thing, let's take this thing and try to convert it into Wasm. Uh, what to Wasm? I already have it installed, as you can see, so I already have it on my machine. And I'm going to just uh, pass it hello what, and it succeeded, and it created a Wasm file, which is quite cool. And let's take a look inside of that Wasm file. Well, there is some garbage in here. All right, and if we take a look in Excel mode, yeah, there's some bytes in here. So I suppose this is a magical uh, magical number that spells as ASM. And I guess here we have an empty module, essentially. Right, so this is WebAssembly, right? This is how WebAssembly looks like. It's a binary format, you cannot read it. It's not meant to be read by humans. It's meant to be executed by browsers or environments where you have um, you know, WebAssembly virtual machine. Mm. How do you execute this thing, actually? How do you even execute it? <clears throat> well, you cannot just give it to the browser like you give uh, JavaScript to the browser uh, via the script tag, right? You cannot just do something like uh, hello wasm and execute it. No, 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 no. It is not an option in a modern world. You have to use JavaScript to load WebAssembly module, to load WebAssembly modules, and only then you can run functions of that WebAssembly module. Yes, it's absolutely beautiful. All right, so um, you can do that in a browser or you can do that in Node.js. Like I, I'm gonna do that in Node.js because I think I, like, I don't wanna mess with the browsers, like open console and stuff like that. Um, I don't know, but maybe we, we can do that in a browser just to demonstrate that it works in a browser. Why not? Okay, let's do that in a browser. Sure, sure, this turns into a web development session. I love web development. It's my favorite. Uh, index HTML. Um, okay. So this is going to be... Um, did I fuck it up again? I think I fucked it up again. Let me restart my Emacs one more time. One more time. Uh, okay. So let me start Emacs in here. Uh, index HTML. So it's going to be tag. I uh, actually want to switch to HTML mode. Yeah, now we're talking. Uh, tag head tag i um, title, and the title is going to be WebAssembly 
uh, demo, right? Because that's what it is. And then we're going to have a body. And uh, we need to essentially include some script in here, right? So let's actually do something like this. It's going to tag i script. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's going to be src and it's going to be index.js. There we go. So <laughs> it's kind of interesting, right? You cannot run JavaScript directly in the browser. You have to use HTML to load JavaScript. All right, then that JavaScript will load WebAssembly for you. <laughs> So we have like three layers of abstraction, but well, technically you can still put the JavaScript in here, but you're still using HTML to bootstrap JavaScript. <laughs> so to run WebAssembly, right? To run WebAssembly, you need uh, you need at least two languages. The first language is HTML, uh, and the second one is JavaScript. So HTML will somehow make JavaScript running, and then JavaScript will somehow make you WebAssembly running. Welcome to the modern software development. The software development that we deserve. Um, cheers, everyone. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so. <sighs> Okay, so we're gonna do something like window on load, and when everything is loaded up, uh, we're gonna do our thing. <clears throat> and I think the easiest way in here would be to, I don't know, use async functions because a lot of things in WebAssembly they are very much asynchronous. All right, so let's actually try to do async functions. I'm not super familiar with asynchronous functions, so forgive me if I make very stupid mistakes. Uh, so here's the start, and I'm gonna do console log. Start it, all right. And as far as I know, you just need to do start and maybe catch some errors. I forgot how you, you catch them, I forgot how you catch them. Uh, JavaScript uh, promise. Uh, so what are the methods of this stuff? What are the methods? Then it is literally called catch. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's actually confused me that the catch is also a keyword, but apparently you can have a keyword uh, as the function name. Okay, so th that's fine. Sure. Sure, that's fine. So it's going to be uh, error e and uh, can you can you even do console error you should be able to console error yeah you can do it cool uh so let me try to run this entire thing in the browser and is it going to be working is it going to be twerking we're about to find out console and it says it started absolutely beautiful isn't that amazing i think it's good damn amazing started uh, this entire thing has started. So the next thing we need to do, I think we need to uh, fetch the uh, the WebAssembly file, right? We need to literally fetch it. What's interesting is that you cannot fetch it uh, over the file schema, right? So <laughs> we're using the file schema um, and uh, yeah, you, you cannot fetch it because of the course or something, but maybe there is a way to bypass course in this particular case, but I don't think I know of, of such way. So let's actually do something like uh, hello wasm, right? So we're trying to fetch it and we're going to put it into like wasm, right? And let's see what's going to happen in here. Uh, I'm going to refresh it and there we go. So uh, fetch API cannot load URL scheme must be HTTP or HTTPS for course requests. Okay, so that means uh, you need to also have HTTP server. Right. To run a web assembly in a browser, you not only need two separate languages, right? HTML to bootstrap JavaScript and JavaScript to bootstrap a web assembly. You also need to do that over a web server. Right. So you have a web assembly module. You cannot just run uh, that module in a browser. Right. You, you can't just like give it to the browser and browser will run. No, 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 no. You, you, you cannot do that. I'm sorry. So there's too many layers of abstractions and too many layers of legacy and backward compatibility to maintain for decades. You cannot do that. I'm really sorry. So let's actually start a web server that will actually serve all of that uh, for, for us somehow. 
so we're going to use Python 3, uh, simple HTTP server. Uh, I'm actually going to run it like this, uh, Python 3 uh, M HTTP server. And uh, there we go. Did, does it work? Does it work? Okay, so now I'm going to actually, uh, okay, it uses the 8000. All right. All right. And it did a thing. I think it did a thing and maybe one of the things we can do in here we can try to do console log wasm there we go and yeah we will get a promise we've got a promise and uh, which is already fulfilled so to get the actual fulfilled thing in here I think we need to await it in here right so this is basically here is the response uh, we got a response though right mm -mm -mm. I wonder if we can just give it to WebAssembly instantiate. Anyway, so we've got the thing. We managed to query the thing. This thing is correct. So if I try to do it like that, it will say it's an error because there's no such file. It's 404. Beautiful. So, but this one actually works. All right. So WebAssembly instantiate. So the next thing you need to do, you need to instantiate a WebAssembly instance. Right, you need to instantiate a WebAssembly instance. So buffer source, uh, usually array buffer. Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> so compile streaming. Okay, so as far as I know, we won't be able to do compile streaming. Uh, <laughs> I can try to do it and we'll see why actually. Uh, so let me, let me show you. So if you try to do something like hello wasm, right? And here comes the uh, wasm instance itself. We're gonna be awaiting it, right? So as you can see, this one is a pretty straightforward. You just fetch uh, the, the wasm thingy and you give it to WebAssembly streaming, precisely what we have in here, right? Precisely what we have in here. And it should just work, uh, but it won't work by the way. It won't work by the way. So, uh, oh, it actually worked. All right. Oh, I remember it didn't work over Python 2. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, wait a second, just a second, because it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, so if I go to asynchronous thing, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you go to a synchronous thing, and if you try to, I mean, I know that nobody uses Python 2 in 2021, but bear with me, uh, HTTP server, if you use something like this, right, so it's a Python 2, and it still doesn't, it still works, surprisingly. Okay, so maybe something changed since the last time I, I checked it. All right, that's actually pretty good that something changed. So the, the problem was, a long time ago, is that this thing wouldn't work if a specific um, MIME type is not set. I, I, I don't even know how this thing is pronounced, but it's supposed to be set to WebAssembly, uh, to application WASM or something. Otherwise, it just won't even compile anything in here. And uh, Python... Uh, simple Python server didn't set it because it was just serving like uh, binary data, but now it works for some reason. I don't know. Sometimes things work, sometimes things don't. But anyway, all right. So um, after we instantiated everything, right, uh, we should be able to. Oh, it's actually compiling stream. Is there something like instantiate streaming? Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna look at one of my uh, previous projects because uh, I can never remember how to uh, instantiate this thing properly. <sighs> I can never remember how to do that. Uh, yeah. So you have to fetch the file, you have to take the array buffer, uh, and then you have to instantiate streaming. Well, I mean, this is a, a completely different thing. Okay, so we can instantiate streaming. Uh, all right, so let's do instantiate streaming. Instantiate streaming. I think that's what it has to be. Uh, and if I refresh it, okay. So I also need to run it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we managed to instantiate WebAssembly. Okay, cool. So um, and there you go. You instantiated WebAssembly, and now inside of this thing you have instance right so you have wasm instance and inside of the instance you have exports 
right? You have experts. And if your module uh, would export any of the functions, you would have these functions in here and you would be able to call these functions like this. So this is what it takes to run your WebAssembly in a browser, right? So you need to have a WebAssembly module, right? Then you use HTML to bootstrap JavaScript and then you use JavaScript to bootstrap WebAssembly, right? And uh, inside of JavaScript, you have to make another query uh, you have to need another query to receive this binary blob, then instantiate it, and then deep inside of the instance, you have the export of that WebAssembly module, and you can run these specific functions. Of course, a lot of these systems, a lot of frameworks, compilers, they uh, do abstract away that thing from you, uh, right? But if you are the author of these frameworks and these languages, you... Uh, need to know this kind of stuff because at, uh, to abstract these things away somebody has to do that somebody has to abstract those things away for other people and it is important that people still understand how these things work in my opinion but my opinion doesn't matter all right, so as you can see, uh, right now our WebAssembly module doesn't really export anything in here because it's just like, you know, a simple module. Uh, let's actually make it export something. Let's make it export something. So uh, what can we do in here? What can we do in here? So we can define a function inside of it, right? We can define a function. So the way you define a function, you use keyword func, and then you define parameters. You specify the type of the parameters, and you can also have local variables and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, you can also assign names to these parameters. Uh, all of that is a textual representation. It has nothing to do with the actual binary representation. So this textual representation is just like for a human readability, right? For human readability. Uh, so let's actually define a function. Um, so can I just do something like uh, power edit? Do I even have a what mode? Uh, do I even have a what mode? I remember at some point I had the what mode installed on my Emacs. So do we have it in here? What mode? No, we don't have it. Emacs what mode? Uh, so it's available in here. I'm too lazy. I can use a Lisp mode, I suppose. <laughs> let's, use, let's use a Lisp mode. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to define a function, all right? And that function, um, that function, where is my... It's going to have two parameters, right? So it's going to have a parameter uh, of the type i32 and another parameter uh, is going to be of the type i32 as well. Right. And as far as I know, you can also specify the, yeah, you can also specify the result, right? So what's, what's your function is going to return? Uh, and there we go. So as far as I know, parameters are local functions, right? They are, uh, lo they're local variables, right? And the, th the thing you can do, you can do something like local get, uh, and you specify the index of this parameter, right? You specify the index. Okay, I want to get the parameter uh, at index zero and push its value on the stack, right? Again, we know how the stack-based virtual machine work. We push this thing on the stack. Then I do local get one. So that means I get this parameter and I push it value on the stack. And then I want to sum them up. Right, and uh, to do that, I just do i32 add, right? So this thing acts precisely as our instruction add, right? It works precisely our instruction add and takes two elements on the stack, sums them up and put it back on the stack. And result is supposed to be um, a top element on the stack. So I declare that the result is going to be i32 and the result of summing up i32 and i32 is i32. So that should be correct, right? So this is a basic program in WebAssembly that sums up two numbers that you, uh, that you give it. So, but again, it's a text representation. Browsers cannot run it. You have to compile it down to a binary format. And to compile it down to binary format, we have to feed it to what to wasm. And this is probably not going to work because I probably made some sort of mistakes. And it worked. Uh, okay, so our the size of our wasm was 8 bytes. The size for an empty module is 8 bytes. If we refresh it now, now it's 32 bytes. 
right um, and excuse me it's it's 32 bytes so it's a little bit bigger this is because it contains the implementation of our function right and if we go inside of this thing there you go we have a bunch of things and um yeah so this is essentially a function that sums up two numbers that you give it uh compiled down to WebAssembly binary code that you can now try to run in a browser um, okay, so let's actually do the following thing. In index.js, I'm going to simply call uh, console log wasm and let's take a look at the instance of that wasm. Let's take a look at the instance of that wasm. So, yeah, I forgot to save this entire thing. Right, if you take a look at the instance, we still don't have any exports. We implemented a function, but we still don't have any exports. And this is because it is not enough to just find a function in there. You have to export it. I don't remember how to export function. <laughs> uh, I think it's something like export uh, hello. I think this is how you export functions. <laughs> Uh, let me try to recompile this thing one more time. And I, I guess I, I was right. So now the size went up from 32 to 43. And the reason why it went up is because now the WebAssembly module needs to store the name of your function. Right, as you can see, now we have a hello and it needs to store that name because it needs to be displayed in the, in the browser, right? So it needs to be stored somewhere. And now if you refresh your browser and look inside of the instance and one of the experts is gonna be hello funk, oh my God. Yes, here it is. Here's our F function, uh, well, hello function uh, that we wrote directly in WebAssembly. All right. So um, let me now try to call it. So now inside of JS, you should be able to do wasm uh, instance exports hello 34, 35, and let's print the result of this thing. Let's print the result of this thing. 69, right. So that's what it takes to run WebAssembly in your browser. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that exciting? This is the future of computing. Yes. I absolutely love it. Cheers. For the future of computing. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, and uh, yeah, you can uh, work with this thing directly if you want to. Of course, in, in real world, you're not going to be doing this kind of stuff directly. You're going to be writing program like in C or in Rust or any other thing in C Sharp. I think C Sharp has a couple of frameworks that um, do all of this heavy, heavy lifting for you. Uh, so you don't have to think about it, but they also generate shit ton of blood. But I mean, who fucking cares? Just buy a better computer. Um, so... <clears throat> But what is Wazi? Like, what the fuck is Wazi? <laughs> right. Um, so, okay, you can actually put data from JavaScript from the outside world into WebAssembly. As you can see, we, we did uh, this thing here, uh, right? We gave WebAssembly numbers 34 and 35, and WebAssembly managed to crunch them, just add them together and return us the, the thing. But what if WebAssembly wants to go the other way around? What if the WebAssembly wants to call a, a JavaScript function? Right. What if WebAssembly needs to do like a printf debugging of some sort? Right. How do you do that from WebAssembly? Well, again, WebAssembly is a little bit more uh, complicated virtual machine. Like it's actually way more complicated virtual machine than this. So it has a mechanisms of imports. Right. It has a mechanisms of imports. So inside of the WebAssembly module, you can declare uh, what functions are you going to import? Are you going to import? And the environment, specifically browser, will be able to provide uh, the implementations for those functions that you import. And if a WebAssembly calls uh, one of these functions, it will basically call JavaScript functions, right? So that way you will be able to sort of write bindings um, for for WebAssembly, right? So um, let me let me see what we can do in here. So web assembly uh, web assembly import functions. How do you import functions? I don't remember. I do not remember how you do that. 
So, well, I mean, I already did that before, so I might as well actually take a look at one of my, one of my codes, one of my codes. So I think it's, uh, yeah, you can import memory and you can also import specific functions. Okay, so this is precisely how we do that. So you declare that you uh, have a function and its name inside of the WebAssembly is going to be $print. Uh, it's going to be imported inside of like this uh, path and this function has a single parameter uh, i32. Right. So, and essentially, uh, then you should be able to call it. Uh, yeah, you can literally just use call uh, print. Right. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, instead of returning this entire stuff, right, instead of returning the result of the sum, right, we can actually call print um, and the print will actually consume it. So now we need to provide this function in JavaScript. So as far as I know, you have to provide it index.js. Uh, you have to provide it somewhere here, right? So you can have imports. And uh, uh, let me see, there was example in here. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, 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 uh. Stream, instantiate streaming. I think it's the second parameter of instantiate streaming. I'm pretty sure it's the second parameter of this thing. Yeah, import object. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so we have to do imports. Um, ba, 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 ba. I don't remember how you have to specify it. So maybe you just have to be JS, uh, right? And then you're going to have a print, and the print is going to be a function that x uh, that takes x and prints something like um, this function was called by web assembly program with uh, per, uh, with argument uh, x there we go so that's how we do that uh, let's now try to well first of all we need to recompile our web assembly program right it recompiled successfully and let's find our thing in here and it didn't work nice i'm absolutely happy uh, i cannot see so it failed somewhere where did it fail i clicked on oh yeah okay it worked okay so uh, this is the 404 actually <laughs> okay so it says this function was called by WebAssembly program with the argument 69 okay so as you can see it worked right so what we did in WebAssembly in here instead of returning this thing we called uh print with this argument and print was provided by javascript so we went from WebAssembly and then from WebAssembly back to javascript right so that's how we do that all right and uh, as you can see so this like a sequence of these imports right uh, and like a collection of these imported functions form an interface between your WebAssembly program and the environment in which WebAssembly is running. It is an interface. And again, so where you have an interface, uh, you usually have a madness, right? Because you may have programs that uh, expect one interface from the environment and, and other programs will, have, uh, will expect another uh, inter interface from the environment. So this kind of interface uh, wants standardization, right? So what kind of functions uh, you can expect from the environment that you can call uh, from WebAssembly. Uh, will you always have this print? I don't know. Maybe will you always like have a function that opens a file, right? Open file. I don't know. Like it's kind of weird to have this function in a browser. Like browser, does the browser even have an access to the file system? Well, I mean, it does have some sort of access to the file system but if you're like running the program in node it does make sense to have this kind of function you see like it just depends on the environment and this kind of interface needs standardization and as far as i know that's what wasi is yes 
<laughs> as far as I can, I never looked inside of the Wazi, but as far as I know, Wazi is just, yeah, let's standardize what the fuck you can put in here. Because different people may put different things in here, like, like how do we know? Let's standardize that. And that's, I think, what it is. So, yeah. Um, and on today's stream, after an hour of explanation, what the fuck is Wazi, I would like to check out Wazi. How about that? How about that? Uh, but before I check out Wazi, I want to make a small break and I want to make a cup of tea. And uh, after I make a cup of tea, we're going to go into uh, different tutorials. As you can see, you have tutorials, examples. Uh, I want to read more about this thing and see if it's something interesting. Because uh, I worked a lot of with WebAssembly. Like, I wrote just WebAssembly programs that don't rely on any standardized interfaces with the environment. I just, like, you know, did small, small things here and there, just small shed posts. But maybe the time has come to standardize my work, you know, the time has come to grow up and admit that, yes, the interface between environment and your program has to be standardized. So yeah. anyway, let, let's, let's make a small break. I want to make a cup of tea. So it's going to be in a snap because, I mean, it's an offline stream. I can just easily pause and I'm back. Uh, okay. So let's take a look at what the hell is WASI. Um, all right. WASI is a modular system interface for WebAssembly as described in the initial announcement. It is focused on security and portability. Of course, everything in 2021 is focused on security and portability. This is such a new concept. Oh my God. Oh my God. Nobody ever cared about portability and security ever. And yeah, we're doing that for the first time. My God. Uh, okay, cool. Thank you very much. Very interesting. So, uh, Wazi is being standardized in a subgroup of a WebAssembly CG. Uh, discussions happen in GitHub issues and bi-weekly Zoom meetings. Can we join bi-weekly Zoom meetings? Oh my I can't join bi-weekly Zoom meetings. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, very interesting. Uh, so for a quick intro to Wazi, including getting started using it, see the intro document. Okay, intro document. Very interesting. Uh, so the Wasm time runtimes tutorial contains example for how to target Wazi from C and Rust. The resulting Wasm modules can be run in any Wazi compliant runtime. My God, my can't. Uh, do I have a wasit time? I don't even know what the fuck is a wasit time. Uh, wasm time. No, not not wasit time. Right. Mm -hmm. all right. Let's close all the shit and uh, let me see. Wasm time. It's mother flipping wasm time. Uh, standalone uh, JIT style runtime for WebAssembly using Cranel. What? What are these words? I never. What is it? Cr crane lift? What the hell is crane lift? Crane lift is a code generator and it's been archived. <laughs> Wait. Uh, the crane lift source now lives in was. Ah, they, they merged it back in. Okay, sure. Cool. Um, cool, 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 cool. Um, um, okay, I wonder if uh, I have wasn't time in my debian stale machine of course i don't <laughs> what did you expect i don't know what i expect okay so let's actually take this malicious script and run it on our machine with a root access so installing latest version oh shit the fuck is going on uh user profile uh yeah i really love how these scripts like just just, just fucking edit your bash rc like <laughs> So fucking rude. Uh, imagine me working hard on my on my bash RC and then just some script comes in and just hey, I'm gonna fucking edit that shit for you. Open a new terminal to start using wasn't time. Uh, so what did they do actually there? Let's actually take a look. Uh, I wonder if I'm not gonna leak anything sensitive. I don't think I'm leaking anything sensitive. So we have a wasm time. So we have a separate folder called wasm time. Uh, and if I go to wasm time uh and you have a bin and what is this file 
this file is f you could have just let me download this file myself i couldn't do that myself does this thing think that i can't i don't know how to download files from the internet at, and put them in folders <laughs> this is so insulting i don't know this is like i, I know how to do that like just like okay uh and uh, sure <laughs> Which wasn't time. Uh, all right, so wasn't time, motherfucker. Wasn't time. Uh, and then you can. Oh shit! So can I just run my example uh, that we like implemented at the beginning with wasn't time? Motherfucker, wasn't time. Uh, all right, and error to run main module. Hello, wasn't. Um, fail to instantiate unknown import js print was not or has not been defined ah i see what's going on in here so yeah why is it probably doesn't have js print or something like that okay uh let's try to do something in here let's try to do something mm -mm -mm -mm. so i'm thinking uh that i kind of want to make a Maybe I don't want to make a make file, but yeah. So let's do what to wasm, right? Uh, first of all, let's actually remove all of these prints, right? Let's actually remove all of them. And let's not call print. And let's also announce that hello is going to return i32. Okay, let's actually go back in here. Uh, and then I'm going to recompile everything. And let's do wasm time, motherfucker. Wasm time and nothing happened. Nice. I don't know what I expected, but did it exit with like, and it exited with a zero uh, exit code, cool. Um, okay. <sighs> so uh, let me see, let me see. So maybe we can take a look at some of the um, tutorials and examples. Tutorial. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We'll split the tutorial into two parts. In the first part, we'll walk through compiling C and Rust programs to WASM and executing the compiled WebAssembly module using WASM time runtime. In the second part, we'll discuss the compilation of a simpler WebAssembly program written using WebAssembly text format and executing this using WASM time runtime. Nice. All right. Compiling to WASM from C. Let's start with a simple C program which performs a file copy, which will show to uh, which will show the compile and run programs as well as perform simple sandbox configuration. The C code here uh, uses standard POSIX API and doesn't have any knowledge of WASI, WebAssembly, or sandboxing. Interesting. So the Clank, oh, I'm assuming that you're going to be using Clank because Clank, yeah, Clank can compile to, to Wasm or something. Um, Clank takes POSIX layer and translates it to Wasi, which further confirms my point. Wasi is POSIX for WebAssembly and Wasi is an attempt of big corporations to actually compete with POSIX. Where is my tin, tinfoil hat? <laughs> Uh, but does it does this really have to be this complicated? Can we just take hello world and simply simply compile hello world and see if it prints something? I don't know. That would be actually kind of cool. So the WASI SDK, SDK provides a clank which is configured to target WASI and use the WASI sys root. Now I have to install WASI SDK. Do I really have to install WASI SDK or something? uh i don't want to do that i maybe maybe i'm not gonna do that because it's kind of it's kind of meh it's kind of meh but you the, we also provide like an extension wasm maybe the text that this extension wasm and just do that um do, do, do. Do, 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 do. Okay, let me do the following thing. I want to kind of uh, clean up this entire thing and create like a make file in here. All right, let's create a make file. Uh, to be fair, maybe maybe not. Uh, so because I want to like split these things into separate folders. Like uh, I'm gonna have like a my own VM and I'm gonna move everything related to this like my own VM in here. 
Right, then uh, we have Wasm, um, Wasm Browser Demo, right here it is, and here's everything related to Wasm Browser Demo. Um, so here we have uh, Custom Simple VM, right? So uh, maybe even I'm gonna actually like number it like this. Uh, 02 Wasm Browser Demo, and there we go. <clears throat> So, and maybe the next phase is going to be 0, 03, uh, try, uh, like testing, maybe trying, I think trying is going to be better, trying out Buzzy, right? So, and in here we have a VM, I'm going to rename it to Buzzy Stream, right? Uh, yeah, let's call it Buzzy Stream, Quasi Stream. <laughs> so, so, and let me remove all of this stuff. Right, let me remove all of this stuff and I'm going to create a make file in here, uh, which creates a VM from main C. It's going to be using CCWOW extra. Uh, the standard is going to be C99, it's going to be extremely pedantic, right? And maybe we're going to enable uh, all of the possible optimizations because we want our uh, virtual machine go brrrr go brrr, vm main.c there we go and once you try to like build this entire thing uh yep 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 it's going to give you this and uh then it's going to just do that and also output this thing so we may try to also get ignore all of this garbage in here so we're going to get ignore this and we're going to get ignore everything that starts uh, like with ends with vm thingy all right, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so, Wasm browser demo. So, in the Wasm browser demo, we are generating Wasm, right? So, I want to create another make file in here, uh, and this one is going to be basically hello Wasm. Uh, it depends on hello what, and we just do what to Wasm. Uh, and we're just generating it like this, and then we're going to git ignore. Uh, git ignore uh, wasm in this specific folder. So um, maybe I'm also going to do a readme.md um, saying something like simple uh, stack based virtual machine in C. Uh, and we're gonna have a quick start in here, quick start, uh, console, it's gonna be make, and then you just run VM, and that is it. Um, so read the source code, uh, read main.c, main.c for more information and education. <laughs> All right, so the next one is going to be read me. Um, uh, wasm in browser. Uh, it's actually called raw wasm in browser demo, right? So, and then we're going to have a quick start. Uh, and in a quick start, you're going to just do make. Uh, and then you're going to open your favorite browser. Right, so you're gonna open your favorite browser and just open uh, index.html on it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess that's how you're gonna do that. Uh, look, open dev tools console and uh, observe the output. And observe the output so this is what expected in here in here we're going to be trying out the buzzy uh and to be fair i don't really want to install like wazi sdk and stuff like that um but i already have rust right i already have rust so and as far as i know rust has a target for wasm and it also has a, se a separate target for wazi in wasm so we can try to use that and just explore that thing somehow i suppose that's one of the things we can do so and also i'm going to actually put the license in here uh so it's going to be uh, all that is going to be released under mit you can do whatever you want with it um so um, maybe we want to actually do some sort of a readme um i don't know um <clears throat> 
so RT RT facts of uh, YZ uh, YZ like sodding session uh, of sodding session on YZ okay I don't know that's basically what it is maybe there's no readme I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it makes any sense to, to put it here but yeah um, so maybe I'm gonna put a link to this video in the in the readme a little bit later but for now uh, I'm gonna do git init uh, and let me see if I can commit all of that so we have that uh, we have that and it's gonna be already set a go right and um, <clears throat> so maybe I'm gonna quickly create a, a private repo I'm gonna quickly create a private repo where I'm gonna actually put all of that so and maybe that private gist is gonna be completely obsolete now right so it's gonna be wazi stream um, wazi sodium stream artifacts uh, and this one is gonna be private let's just create the repo let's use to create the repo and I'm gonna just copy paste this entire thing and add origin eh, 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 eh. add origin and I'm gonna put it put in here uh-huh uh -huh. right, let's push that right into the repo mate right into the repo mm -mm -mm. Is it there? Is it there? Seems to be. Seems to be there. So this uh, kind of private gist that I put in here is sort of obsolete, right? Is it sort of obsolete? But I'm gonna just gonna uh, I'm just gonna keep it here because as the video progresses, maybe people will look into the description and look into this thing because uh, at the point when this thing was created, people didn't know that there will be a repo in here. Uh, so I'm gonna put it in here, like wazi sodium stream uh, repo, and let's just put it in here. So wazi stream, so, but this repo is also gonna contain the custom, um, custom simple VM. Um, Maybe it should be called simple custom VM, but I mean, I don't speak English anyway, so. Anyways, any, anyways, um, so let's go to here somewhere, zero three. So let's actually try to do something like this. I'm gonna create a, like a very simple Rust program, right? Something like print ln, uh, hello world. And can I compile it down to WebAssembly WASI? Wazi. Waza. Okay, so I can compile it down to like native code, right? Did it did it save it? I think it didn't save it. So here it is. So Rust C main R S. Okay, so it's taking some time. I need to warm up some hard uh, hard drive caches and whatnot and there we go we have a 3.2 megabytes of a hello world isn't that exciting i think it's goddamn exciting here it is here's the hello world yes 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 cowboy fucking this so i do have just web assembly targets because i needed that target for rust browser game right again you can find it in the description maybe can you can you find it in the description uh, yeah, 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 I mentioned it. Um, so, and to build this entire game, if I remember correctly, you need to install Wasm, Wasm 3232 target through Rust up. And uh, so how do you use this target? Let's take a look at the make file. Uh, you use it like this, you, like this you, you set target to that and you just compile it. I wonder if it's gonna work for our hello world. I just want to see how it's gonna how it's gonna fail, right? So this one is gonna be main.rs, and let's let's put it like this. Okay, is it gonna work? <sighs> Emacs is extremely annoying. Okay, so this is again. This is a main, and it should fail. I'm pretty sure it should fail. Okay, it didn't fully fail. Uh, which is rather interesting so and it generated like one megabyte of this stuff and where does it print everything where does it print everything this is a good question so it's just like a fully bosom 
All right, let's try to run it in a browser. Can we just run it with wasm time? Uh, wasm time. Uh, maybe I should restart my browser. Yeah, I think I should restart my my email. <laughs> I just called Emacs browser. Haha, <laughs> very funny. Okay, Wazi stream 03. And uh, yeah, can I do wasm time on the main dot wasm? And it did nothing. It didn't print anything. It exited with zero uh, exit code. It literally did nothing. Welcome to modern software development. Like, I mean, in this particular case, if the executable is not correct, right? So, which is probably the case, and that's why it doesn't work. Okay. I would expect Wasm Time at least tell me something. <laughs> right. uh, but it didn't tell anything. It didn't say anything, right? So, at least it would say something like, bruh, this is not like Wasi compi uh, compliable or something. Anyway, maybe we can try to run it in a browser using our like uh, bootstrapping setup. Mm hmm. So, uh, wasm browser demo. So, I'm going to just copy paste these things in here, right? So, here are the things. And in here, what we're loading, in fact, is hello wasm, right? So, we're importing hello wasm. Maybe I need to do something like main wasm, right? So, because here it is. Uh, and that should be enough. Uh, I can now try to do Python 3M uh, HTTP server 69, 69, and let's just run it and see if it's going to do something. Right. Uh, and it didn't even, uh, okay. Wasm hello is not a function. All right. So, mm -mm -mm -mm. So maybe I should not run this in. Oh yeah, I need to start it somehow. I wonder if uh, I can just see what's the entry point. Yeah, let's actually try to do it like that. So I'm gonna print the whole wasm context and see what, what kind of things do we have in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here are the experts. And you have a main. Okay, so you do have a main. And can we try to run that main? That would be interesting. Uh, so I'm gonna just do something like main. I'm not going to provide anything. I'm just going to run it. Uh, yep, yep, yep. And uh, it didn't do anything because it couldn't output anything to to stuff. Hmm. Uh, it's kind of funny that I'm obviously doing incorrect things. So yeah, I'm obviously doing incorrect things and none of the system actually even <laughs> like sort of warn me that I'm doing incorrect things. Neither Rust compiler, no browser, nor wasn't time, nor anything. Just tell me that I'm doing incorrect things. Anyways, so I wonder um, if I try to disassemble it. So Wabbit, by the way, on top of having what to wasm, also has wasm to what. So you can do uh, a reverse operation. You can take a wasm uh, file and convert it into what. So let's try to do that. I'm going to do something like what uh, wasm to uh, to what, right? And yeah, there we go. This is what we got. And uh, we have a bunch of functions and whatnot. And I wonder, do we import anything? This thing doesn't even import anything. <laughs> Right, so I like how the thing that is supposed to um, produce side effect just compiled with any, without any problems, doesn't import anything, doesn't complain about anything, and just lives in its own world. So it doesn't, like, I didn't see any imports. Like, yeah, there's no imports in here. Uh, exports... Maybe, yeah, well, it exports the memory. Maybe it prints things into the memory. Maybe that's the case in here. Let me double check that. Um, yeah, I do run main, so I do run main. Maybe I can take a look at the memory somewhere. Here's the instance. Exports, memory. Maybe we can see something inside of the memory being printed. Uh, yeah, I don't really see anything. So... Yeah, it's just like, yeah, it's, it lives in its own world. I, I, I know that I'm doing something incorrect, right? So I'm supposed to be using like a WASI interface, a quasi interface. But I just wanted to try that and see if any of these like runtimes will react somehow to that. But I guess, yeah. All right. So um, as far as I know, uh, there is a list of targets supported by, by Rust, right? So... 
if I try to Google Rust WASM32 unknown unknown, we'll find this page. Uh, uh, WebAssembly support. So yeah, you have WASM3232 unknown, but there was like a page of um, of supported targets. Rust supported targets. Uh, platform sub. I think that's what it was. I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, there we go. Wasm unknown. Yeah, there we go. Here's the list of all of these things. So you have Wasm unknown uh, in scripten, and there is a Wasm wasi, uh, and this is precisely what we probably need to install in here. Let's actually install it. The way you install new targets is through Rust up usually. So let's quickly do that. Um, okay. So Wasm thirty two wasi. There we go. Mm -mm. All right, that was that was quick. Um, so now uh, can I can I just run this thing? Can you Rust C target uh, target wasm wasi and R is. Uh, error loading target specification could not find specification for target wasm wasi print target list uh did i oh it's a wasm ah it's a wasm 32 i'm sorry it's a 32 okay so the previous size was 1.6 megabyte and it's now it's 1.8 probably to a accommodate the imports or something i don't know <laughs> all right so this is a completely different executable uh compiled to a different target <laughs> uh, hi uh all right uh so <clears throat> Let me see, let me see. I want to do uh, wasm to, to what, right? It's going to be wasm to what, and I'm going to just take a look at the imports in here. Uh, and now we're talking. Look at that. Look at that. Now we are talking. So here are the imports. We have wasm snapshot preview and some other stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. So proc exit, fd write. All right, I think I know what these things do. Proc exit probably just exits the uh, execution of the program, right? It's similar to exit syscall uh, of Unix, right? If you take a look at the Linux syscalls, right? If you take a look at Linux syscalls, syscall table. Uh, so just a second, I need to find. So here's like a list of syscalls and syscall is essentially interface between your program that running in operating system and the operating system, the kernel, right? So it's kind of similar like imports for WebAssembly program and your browser, right? In the browsers, everybody knows that uh, modern browsers are basically operating systems. So yeah, and you have different syscalls in here. You have open syscall that opens a file, read syscall, and most importantly, there is exit syscall uh, that basically removes the process from you know from existence and i think that's what they are i think that's what they are proc exit basically exit syscall fd write probably um the uh function the, the write syscall that writes to a particular like, output or something uh so there's environment sizes get uh, i don't know what these things do uh some directory names and i guess that's it maybe this this is not a full wasi interface right as i as already said that wasi is basically standardization on what to expect here right so um and since we don't really do much we depend only like six imports in here right so probably it not only standardizes the functions that needs to be imported it probably also standardizes the memory that has to be imported or exported the structure of the memory like maybe the first chunk of the memory has to be um you know allocated for stacks and whatnot another chunk is the memory for the heap and uh, so the entire environment is aware of that and so on 
on and so forth. It's probably not only imported functions. It's probably a little bit more complicated. So yeah, I feel like I need to mention that because uh, there will be people who will be like, actually, actually. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so so far it Im imports only like six of them. And does it even import like a main function? Uh, yeah, there is a main in here. There is a main and... Oh, yeah, so by the way, a wasm time should already work. Yeah, a wasm time should already work and let's let's just run this thing with a wasm time. The flipping wasm time and there we go. Here is the hello world. Here is the hello world. Uh, cool. That is so fast. My God. The technology went so far. Cheers for the future, for the technology. <laughs> so it's actually pretty cool that I can now do that. I wonder if uh, I can run it in the browser. I'm pretty sure I won't be able to run it in the browser because the browser does not provide any of these like magical import functions or whatnot, but that would be interesting to just try out. Let's actually try this out. Let's actually try this out. Uh, so I'm just gonna... Uh, da, 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 da. So I'm gonna just open this thing. So we're in 6969. And import wasi snapshot preview one. Uh, okay, so this is what our program expects it expects wasi snapshot preview all right let's play a little game in here let's play a little game in here and provide that thing you know for for, for the for the executable why not so as far as i know there are wasi polyfills in the browser wasi browser polyfill um uh, i'm pretty sure i actually misspell it yeah, yeah, yeah so but it's kind of boring like i mean eh? Let's actually hack it. So basically, we try to run the wasi thing and it will fail because it cannot find this specific stuff in here. And let's just provide it and see what's going to happen. I think it can be way more interesting than just using polyfill. You know, that's a normy way of doing things. Uh, so import module proc exit. Okay, so uh, let's do the following thing. I'm going to provide a proc exit. And in here, we're going to provide something like uh, console. No, what, what the fuck am I doing? Console, hola, proc uh, exit. Uh, I don't know if any arguments are provided in here. So I'm going to just assume that maybe something is provided. Uh, maybe we can do something like args and just just like this and uh, just print the args like that so basically take everything right take everything and print everything in here sounds like a plan uh right so we're gonna like trace this entire shit fd right okay so let's also implement fd right for this thing um mm -mm -mm. so here's the fd right do we need anything else so we also need environ size get all right um environ size get uh, okay uh so environ environ get environ get uh -huh. uh fd pre stat get all right fd prestat get uh prestat dear name um mm -hmm. dear name okay it actually did something all right so we did fd write one i'm I swear to fucking God, this is a pointer. I swear to God, this is a pointer in the memory. So if we go there in the memory, we may actually find something there. Hmm. 
and one and two probably standard inputs and standard outputs like standard error or whatnot uh, but this is actually very weird fd right so it accepts four arguments in here mm, it accepts four arguments in here and of course it actually completely panicked when when it tried to do something else in here uh run start panic and whatnot it's it actually reached the unreachable yeah 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 so probably fd right is supposed to return something and my best guess by the way my best guess on what it's supposed to return would be the amount of written bytes yes i'm pretty sure it's supposed to return the amount of written bytes because this is usually how write syscalls work Right, write syscall, uh, accept the file descriptor, the buffer that you want to write, the amount of elements that you want to write, and they usually return how much was written. And based on that, you make an assumption that something uh, wrong happened or not. And because we didn't return anything, uh, Rust environment didn't expect that and panicked. Okay, so maybe Rust programs after all are super safe. You see, you're running in a completely like malicious environment and this thing just crashes. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Everyone should program in Rust and abandon C. Cheers for Rust, cheers for the progress. Mm -mm -mm -mm. All right, so what else do we have in here? Mm -mm. So yeah, yeah, so we need to return like how much we've written. So let's actually assume that we written zero bytes, right? We've written zero bytes and let's see what's gonna happen. And still nothing, nothing pretty much happened. Uh, all right, so my guess was completely incorrect. It's still panics and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it should actually write things into that memory or something. Or maybe we should just read the documentation about this function. So that would be the best thing to do. Wazi, uh, Wazi FD right. Okay. Um, so it's funny that the first thing we see in here is the is Rust. <laughs> I would like to see the official Wazi docs at least. Here are the official Wazi docs. Uh, okay. So this is going to be FD right uh, and and the type. Uh, uh excuse me uh -huh. so i wanted to click in here and eh eh am i an idiot i th i feel like i'm an idiot Because uh, 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 because I'm clicking on this thing and oh here it is a file descriptor subscriber has a okay variant cases a file descriptor subscription of do write has capacity available for writing this uh, event always triggers for regular files. Mm. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I don't understand this documentation. Uh, file of memory access pattern advisory. Two, two, two. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So WebAssembly interface. Oh, you can actually use WASI in here. That's pretty cool. Um, do they mention anything about FD write? Import the, uh, the required FD write WASI function, which will... Okay. So it takes four of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we can clearly see that it takes four integers and returns a single integer. Uh, it takes file descriptor. Okay, I already made sense of that. Then IOVS the amount of this IOVS and and written um so that's very really interesting so what is IOVS uh IOVS IO vector list of scatter gather vectors in which to store data my god uh list of IOVEC 
Huh. This <laughs> is... Uh, file descriptor, okay. So, file descriptor one for std out, uh, the pointer to the IOVAC array, which is stored at a memory location zero. Okay, so as you can see, it's also standard, is standardized. As, oh, well, I mean, it's just like, it's it's, uh, it's us who stored it there. We're printing one string stored in IOVAC, so one. Uh, a place in the memory to store the number of bytes written. Oh, a place in memory to store the number of bytes written. Huh. So it not only returns the number of bytes written, but it also writes that value to the memory, uh, like in two places. That is very interesting. Okay. All right. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So I wonder if we managed to implement that. So, uh, why this is called IOVS if it's just uh, pointed to to printing of one string? Like, what? That is really really strange. So Wasmer Dukes. <laughs> so if we take a look at our example right so here's the file descriptor here is an array of the things that you want to print so it's iovec ah this is because iovec yeah it may probably contain the size and whatnot and some other things Right, 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 right. And this is where you have to store this size written and stuff like that. So it failed somewhere here and it failed inside of this stuff. Okay, I see. This is very interesting. So it's FD write for some reason is more complicated than just write syscall. Right, it accepts file descriptor, it accepts like IOVEX and stuff like that, and it's just like, hmm, why are you doing that? Hmm, why are you doing that? And I'm still not sure what is a uh, IOVEX, so why is it IOVEX? Uh, let's take a look at the Rust documentation. So it's a buffer plus size, all right. Uh, and they're allocated in, in this particular fashion. Uh, so I suppose it's a ah because the actual thing is probably located in a different place yeah so basically it gives you the pointer to the buffer right and the size of that buffer so you have to do like two indirect jumps you have to do two indirect jumps to actually write that so this is a pointer to i of x so inside of IOVEC, you need to find the pointer and the size of the buffer. So you have to do another jump. And then knowing the size of this buffer, you'll have to write that buffer into, into the standard output. And also not forget to write the size of written bytes into that memory as well. And this is probably why it still um, throws unreachable, even though we return like zero in here. Right, so it probably does something weird. So I kind of want to implement fdwrite. I kind of feel like implementing fdwrite. I think it would be kind of cool. So uh, let's actually refactor this entire thing. This one is going to be, of course, fd, then uh, iovex, uh, iovex len, and then n written. Right, so and we can actually print those things uh, like this. So this one is going to be uh fd right all right so this is going to be fd right and then the actual fd in here is going to be something like this mm -hmm. fd uh i of x there we go uh i of x len and this is uh n written there we go there we go uh, all right, so this is basically the precise information of what we have in here. So um, I guess we're going to ignore FD 
right because well i mean we don't necessarily have to ignore it per se um so it's just like if fd is one we have to print everything with console uh, log and if it's fd2 we have to use a uh, console error so that's the the main difference in here so one of the things i would like to do is to find the location of iovec and the question is what's the size of iovec uh i would presume if it's a wasm32 the pointers and the size are 32 bits right so u size i would presume that the u size on um on wasm32 in in rust is actually 32 so ba basically we're gonna have like eight bytes in there uh for this kind of stuff all right this is actually very 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 interesting i want to try that so but i need an access to the memory all right i need an access to the memory and the question is how do we even um have an access to the memory i think we should be able to export the memory because i remember that rust exports the memory uh all right so let me take a look at the instance uh so here is the instance and so here's the module Okay, so maybe exports here is the memory and here is the buffer and here is like everything so we have to do it like that <clears throat> maybe i should actually have fd write like this fd write and let's go fd let's put this stuff in here so it's going to be something like this uh, and uh, let's move everything in there let's move everything in there and this one is going to be just fd right fd right there we go <clears throat> um, do, 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 do. but we need to have an access to the memory we need to have an access to the memory so that means um we have to do that slightly differently unfortunately over over why am i having a problem with that okay so i remember uh the way we access that so i just trying to remember how <laughs> how you access the memory uh i think i'm gonna steal this kind of stuff yeah so you instantiate and you have to take the memory buffer and you have to create a view on that memory buffer yes that's precisely what you have to do <laughs> i don't know why i'm having trouble with that maybe because i'm tired maybe already already something like this uh all right and might as well declare this entire thing like somewhere here right so i'm going to declare it above uh, this one is going to be undefined and of course it's going to be let and let's actually go back to the original code in here right there we go and so now uh, our f write function should have an access to the memory view right so we instantiate everything and then we set the memory view and only then we're running, running main and main would, would start doing all of these things okay 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 all right so i want to take a uh, look at the i of x all right so how do we get this stuff from i of x so if i remember correctly mm, 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 mm. Uh, memory view you have to do the sub array right so you have to do the sub array uh, right sub array starts with i of x right and how many bytes do you want to have well i suppose it's going to be i of x i of x size but the question is what i of x size is equal to I would assume that it's equal to 8 yet again because i of x according to the definition in rust uh, is a pair right I, I actually lost it I actually lost it um, maybe it's somewhere here no let's close everything in here <laughs> 
Uh, Ayuvek Rust. Oh, here it is. I, I had it in history. Um, to, uh -huh. Show declaration. Vazi. Yes. Okay. It's just a pair of a pointer and the size so instead since we're in wasm32 the pointer is probably 30 like uh, 32 bits and the size is also probably 32 bits so the whole size is probably uh eight byte i can using bits and bytes i'm sorry <laughs> i'm already tired but i really want to implement that i think it's going to be cool if we manage to implement that all right so let's actually try to um write this entire thing so uh i'm gonna write it in here literally um right uh yep let's let's give it a try so this one is gonna be yeah we have to go to local 6969 let's take a look at this entire stuff uh game is not defined ah game ah <laughs> because i copy pasted the code uh all right all right look at that oh my god yes i think i was right it does look like true okay it does look legit because you have 13 so this is the pointer and this is the size and it's size 13 if you take a look at the original uh thing in here you have 12 characters oh shit the hello world has 12 characters and printerland adds another one which is a new line it is trying to print hello world yes and the hello world is located in this address and the question is what is the endianus <laughs> what is the endianus in here so essentially we need to extract address from this thing right and find it in the memory that's what we need to do we need to extract the address and find it in the memory and there we're going to have the um <clears throat> the thing Mm hmm okay so this is just that uh and i wonder if we can have a function that converts array of bytes into the number so i want to have something like this let me let me show you what i, what I want function uh, mem to uh number mem to number so we're gonna accept mem uh and go from x of mem i think that's how we're gonna go, uh, go. so this is gonna be a result and this is the result and in here essentially we're gonna do a result multiplied by two-handed yeah essentially something like this plus x right so we're basically appending bytes and i'm gonna assume that the it's a least significant byte so it's a lsb um right uh so shit i wonder if it's gonna work like this uh, we can try but at, at some point we can easily reverse things around so it doesn't really matter that much so uh okay so ivec so this is where we start ivec um mm -mm -mm. ivec pointer offset is zero Ivec size of set is four, right? Uh, so this is basically what we're gonna have in here. Um, okay, so now we need to have two numbers. It's gonna be PTR, Ivec PTR, memory view, sub array, uh, Ivec. Um, starting from that plus iovec ptr it would be cool to have a special function that just does that for you right um so essentially in that function you would have something like uh dear ref right you accept the pointer you accept the size 
and it will just return you the chunk of memory. Well, of course, you also want to accept the memory. Um, so this one should be probably called something like bytes, I don't know. So this is a bytes. Uh, so and in here, we're going to do something like mem sub array uh, pointer, pointer plus size. Yeah, essentially, that's what I want to have. And of course, this entire thing is just going to return you something. So and in here, what I'm doing is just do deref uh, memory view. And the pointer that I'm deallocating is i of x, right, i of x. Uh, plus i of x pointer offset and the size is 4, right? So we know that it's, it's that. i of x size, uh, size of set 4. Um, and in here, maybe we can print these entire values. And on top of that, you can right away uh, convert them to number. So let's actually put it like this bytes to number. Uh, I want to actually kind of print that first before uh, we're going to try to convert this into stuff. So it's going to be iodec ptr and it's going to be iodec ptr like, eh, like this. And this one is going to be uh, size. And let's see if it's going to do something interesting. Uh, all right, iodec ptr. So yeah, we extracted everything correctly. Everything was extracted correctly. This is the pointer, this is the size. And let's see uh, if we can convert all of that to uh, to the actual number. So it's going to be bytes to a number, um, bytes to number. Uh -huh. So what we got, and this is incorrect because you need to reverse them. Okay, so um, JavaScript reverse, uh, can I just reverse? Okay, so maybe this is what I need to do. I need to do a reverse in here. And is it going to work now? Is it going to work now? Yo. Okay. So here's the pointer and here's the size. So the next thing I need to do, I need to take this thing and dereference it yet again. So, so it's going to be something like message is a uh, deref memory view, memory view, uh, the ref memory view starting at iVec PTR and the size of this entire shit is iVec size. There we go. We made like two um, indirect calls. So this one is going to be basically message. Uh, and let's print the bytes of that message. Right. So what do we have in here? All right. And I can see already 10 at the end of it, which is the new line. Oh boy, oh boy, where is my soy? Okay, so um, let me take a look at some other things. So I think Rust, I don't quite remember, but where did I have an encoder? Uh, text, yeah, I forgot how to do the text encoder. So remember I had a couple of things for the GIF, uh, yeah. Yeah, this one. I think this is where I can steal some code. Oh, I never actually committed that code. Interesting. So maybe I, I have it somewhere locally. Uh, so research, wasm, and uh, JS. So yeah, you have to do text encoder. Um, and you take the message and you encode it. Or maybe text decoder, it just depends on what you... Yeah, you usually, usually use UTF decoder. All right, so we're going to treat it as UTF and index.js. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So this one is that. Maybe we actually have to put it somewhere here. All right, there we go. Uh, to, 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 UTF text decode and decode. All right, we will be able to do this kind of stuff. I don't know, we'll see. And hello world! Yesu, 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 yesu. We managed to kind of partially implement FD write function of Wazi. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I think it's kind of cool. Uh, I really like that. It's actually pretty cool. And the next writes, actually, the next writes are rust runtime panicking 
Right, because you can see the message node run Rust backtrace environment. Okay, because the FD write is not implemented correctly. So the Rust runtime tries to panic, but it tries to panic via FD write, which is implemented incorrectly. And that's precisely why it's panicking. So, and that's why it, it's like uh, getting to the unreachable state. That's actually pretty cool. I like that. <laughs> Who needs these boring ass tutorials when you can have this kind of fun? I mean, this is fun. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is actually fun. Can we just like properly implement this thing? I suppose and write, as they say, like, they say it's like the place where you need to put um, the number of written things. Right. I think we can implement that. I think we can. Um, so, all right, so this is what we're going to have in here, um, uh, display lines, so here's the message, uh, I think we're going to ignore I, like, I vex len for now, though, mm, 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 mm. We could have implemented them all because it's just like a matter of iterating through all of them. But I mean, yeah. Hmm. Okay, so let's do the following thing. If FD is equal to one, you're just printing the message. You're just printing the message in like in the standard output, right? Nothing special, just message. Otherwise, if FD is two, uh, you're printing it with error. Otherwise, uh, we can do console uh, assert. I don't remember if console assert uh, what it accepts. Let me see. Uh, console assert, and it's going to be false. Do you accept the message that is going to be sent? Uh, yes, it does accept it. Okay. So, and it's going to be false. Uh, uh, I'm going to put something like this unknown uh, file descriptor. Uh, FD. All right. File descriptor FD. So we're going to ignore this entire stuff. And now we have N written, right? We have an N written. Uh, what we need to do? We need to dereference this thing. So we need to deref uh, memory view N written. Uh, and the size, I would assume, again, it's the variable of four bytes. Right, it's a variable of four bytes because it's a wasm32, so it's going to be probably four. Um, but there's no easy way to write things there, right? Is there? I'm pretty sure there is no easy way to write there. Mm, but I mean, we can just take the message size, IVEC size, and serialize it into there. I think we should be able to do that. Right, first of all, I'm going to just try to implement that and as you can see it managed to print hello world and then it started panicking it's actually oh and it used a vector error oh and it also printed the stack trace now, yeah we can see the stack trace now holy shit we implemented enough wasi we implemented enough wasi to actually see a stack trace in, from rust holy shit this is so cool Okay, uh, that's so fun. What the fuck? Um, all right, so essentially here we can just return something like uh, IOVEC size because this is how many bytes we've written, but that should be not enough, like because we also need to save it into the memory. Uh, right, and as you can see, it still panics. Um, okay, so how are we gonna write it there? I'm gonna just iterate from zero to four plus plus I. All right, and essentially here, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be saving the I of X size. Uh, but I probably want to actually have a copy of I of X size. So I'm going to put something like I of X size here. Uh, and let's put it like this. All right, so, and uh, memory view. I wonder if I can modify this memory. So the memory starts at N written plus I. And in here we have in something like N um mod this right mod this so we take that byte and then we have to div divide this thing by this thing so the to shift it and uh, maybe that will work right because we are putting them in lsb order right 
So if you try to do things like that without reversing, you're going to have a MSB, all right, most significant one, MSB order. But if you do it like that, it's going to be LSB, and I assume that it just expects LSB. Uh, all right, so let's see what's going to happen. And it didn't, it still didn't work, surprisingly. Surprisingly, it still did not work. We can try to dereference this number and just do something like uh, maybe. Oh, maybe the problem here is that it, it, it actually never printed like proc or anything. Uh, thread. Oh, shit. Wait a second. I cannot expand any of this shit. FD write. Okay. So start like main start something something print and it panicked precisely in FD write. Right, and that's everything that it said in here. Um, begin on wind. But maybe like, it never tried to actually run anything else. So I'm not quite sure uh, what exactly is running here. But I want to do the following thing. I'm going to just uh, print uh, whatever we've got in the memory just to see if we got this stuff correctly. Uh, all right. So yeah, it's it's 13, seems to be correct, seems to be correct, and we also return. So maybe I just don't know what is unwritten. Okay, so YZ, FD, right. Let, let, me, uh, let me read more about, well, I mean, Rust doesn't really tell us much about this thing, so I'm not sure. So YZ docs are also kind of obscure. Uh, so still don't quite understand what the hell is FD, right? Uh, file descriptor has a capacity available uh, and written. No, no, man, no. Uh, a place in memory to store the number of bytes written. Uh, discard the number of bytes written from the top of the stack. So, but we we, we do return all of that. We do return. Is is that because like I don't know? It doesn't try to run anything else in here right does it like the only it just doesn't like fd right so that's what's going on in here like it receives something unexpected from fd right it just receives some maybe i'm working with the memory incorrectly maybe that's the thing in here uh maybe i have to like work with it directly or something so here's the memory buffer. Maybe I can modify the memory buffer directly. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm doing this memory view. It's just like something I copy pasted. Uh, let's actually put memory buffer. Uh, so maybe, maybe I can do something like uh, memory buffer. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So this one is, could be memory buffer. And I just need to put this stuff in there and let's see if it actually worked. Well, it should just work, but it doesn't. Still, right, uh, unexpected identifier. Well, yeah, uh, I suppose to set to undefined. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, it technically printed hello world, but I just not sure um, why it doesn't like it and why it starts unwinding and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I have access. Uh, is it really amount of bytes written? Or is it amount of... Mm -hmm. So here's I have size. What if I put Ivic Len in there? Maybe that's what you expect. I, I'm just not sure what it expects. Maybe we could read. Uh, fdiv write implementation from Rust and just see what it expects. We could do that, why not? Uh, 
when you call well i mean it's just an import right it's just an import mm. yeah and right uh -huh. assume init so all right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a pointer, the length. Mm -hmm. From row error. What is a from a row error? A uh, row error. Eh? Where does it where does it come from? Wait, wait, wait. I think so. Create error. Okay. So uh, error from row. It's a from row OS error, but I just don't see it. Okay, Rust uh, Rust error from row error. Uh, am I am I blind? I think I'm blind. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Because it literally cannot find this thing anywhere. Like, where does it come from? Mm. Maybe it's a part of Wazi. It could be part of Wazi, by the way. Speaking of. Hmm. Uh. Why am I so dumb? Mm. Yeah, it's pop. I'm already streaming for two hours. So just give me some slack. Error no. It treats error as error no. So, are you serious? Well, that didn't help. Okay, I don't know. I don't know what it wants, but uh, we managed to get a hello world from this thing, and I'm gonna call it success. All right. So, um, yeah, that was cool. <laughs> to be fair, uh, apart from why is it being just a standardization of what your WebAssembly module can import, there's not that much interesting about it, uh, except like maybe some languages or environments that implement it on top of it. But by itself, it's just like, it's kind of a boring thing. But uh, trying to implement FD right syscall of WASI was kind of fun. We like semi successfully managed to do that. Um, Oh yeah, by the way. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 memory. Memory view. Alright, so we're gonna put a zero in there and memory view. Holy shit! We successfully did that! <laughs> I'm sorry if it was too loud. Yes! I successfully ran Wazi program without wasi polyfill <laughs> I, I just implemented fd right that was hard but i managed to do that holy shit it's so cool <laughs> ah. but you you had to do like manipulate memory directly and stuff like that okay so this stream is a complete success we implemented we polyfilled we polyfilled one function from uh from wasi okay so i'm gonna end the stream uh, here <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's actually. <laughs> That's so. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, without any errors, we managed to do that and no polyfill required. Um, what's funny is that the, the program doesn't even call any of these functions. If everything is successful, right, if everything is successful, it doesn't even fucking call them, but it still requires them because I guess maybe it's a, it's a minimum thing uh, to have there. Well, well, we can just provide them in here. Right, but yeah, so it doesn't even call them. It doesn't even call proc exit. That's what's interesting. Um, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess. Anyway, uh, let me try to do a committee committee. I think, I think this is a very interesting thing to have. Uh, zero three. Uh, and then here we have what? Uh, readme md is going to be a... Mm. I'm gonna actually commit it after the stream, whatever. So, all right. So, uh, you can find the link to this repo in the description. So, I already put it in the description. Uh, the repo is private right now, but after the stream is gonna be unprivated. So, to avoid any spoilers, today was a pretty cool stream. Not gonna lie, it's very, it, it was very educational for me, and it it was very exciting because I managed to sort of hack Wazi without even reading documentation. So. Well, I mean, I read some of the pieces of the documentation, but uh, yeah. So that was very cool and that was very exciting. But unfortunately, boys and girls, it is time for me to go. Even though I was programming in Rust, it is time for me to go. Ah, thanks everyone who's watching right now. I really appreciate it. Have a good one and I see you all tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to be doing uh, a game development in C++ with OpenGL. It's going to be fun. Trust me. And uh, yeah, so check out the description, all the links. Um, yeah, and I gotta go. Love you. Mwah.